The lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born the king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to be shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, for when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go also and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having, seen, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country on another road. The word of the Lord. You know, stars have fascinated humanity since our very beginning. Think about your own life and your early childhood memories of stargazing, of looking up at the moon. I remember in, uh, when Quakertown High School used to have a planetarium. I remember as a kid going over there on a field trip and looking up at that big dome and seeing the stars. Well, the stars that were projected. I remember seeing a wilderness camp guide take us out to the Toboggan Hill in the um, summertime. And we were laying down in the grass, and she had us look up at the night sky, and she pointed out all the different stars and constellations that she could with a green laser pointer. And to my surprise, that laser pointer was able to actually point at the stars, just like it would a, uh, a board um, in a classroom. I was fascinated by things that I never saw so clearly before, constellations that I saw in books but couldn't really find in real life, and I also wanted to figure out where to get such a laser pointer. I remember watching a lunar eclipse with my mom. It was probably in the middle of the night. We both woke up and walked, out, uh, walked outside together to observe it. I'm continually fascinated by the wonder that is the night sky when you get a chance to get away from the city and suburban lights and you look up on a clear night. Do you treasure these moments as much as I do? Historically, cultures throughout the world were not only fascinated by stars, but they would see spiritual significance in them. Many cultures would see the sun rising and know that it provides heat and warmth and know that it provides essential things for their crops to grow, and they worshipped it as a god. The ancient Egyptians saw stars as guides for the souls of the departed to make their way to the afterlife, or as immortal souls themselves. The Magi, the wise men, the three kings, whatever we choose to call them, would study the night sky and look for changes in the night sky, changes in the stars and constellations, and they would see that these changes had significance for how things unfolded in this life down below. They would forecast these changes in their world, even changes of new leaders who would arise. The Jewish people at the time, as well as modern-day Christians, A lot of us would look at such practices of looking at the stars for discerning what king or what president would arise, and, you know, we would call it, or they would call it divination, which is just a fancy term for for using supernatural powers to discern the future um, or to discern things that you can't see. And because we don't see in our scriptures an example of God prescribing this, but also the counter of God condemning these things, These wise men, as welcomed as they would have been in their hometown, these magi, would have been 
possibly seen as charlatans at best and, you know, just people who are messing with the wrong kind of of supernatural power at worst when they came into Jerusalem. And yet, this one true God of ours worked through their methods to guide them to the feet of the little boy named Jesus, who was revealed to them as the rising king of the Jews. And this story of the wise men teaches us a lot about what to do when we're called. When we're called, we follow, we bow, and we change. Last week, we spent a lot of time passing the mic and hearing stories of how God has been moving in your life in 2023. Some shared things of blessings and some shared moments of trial and tribulation. But yet in the trial and tribulation, it's in those lowest of moments that you feel like you've seen and felt God and heard God speak most clearly. A lot of you had expressed um, things that you did in 2023 that enhanced your spiritual life. Some of you expressed how you want to continue those methods, build on those methods, or try other things to deepen your faith in 2024. And I'm going to make a statement into that this morning in response to that. We can all take that desire that we felt last week, maybe the desire that we felt as we were making our New Year's resolutions and included some spiritual faith-based things in that list. We can all take that desire as a clear calling from God. And I can say that pretty confidently because there's no way that God would not want you to draw closer this year. There's no way that God would not want you to read the scriptures more, to pray more, to get to church more, to serve others more, whatever ways in which you draw closer to God. There's no way that God would not want you to do so. And all throughout the scriptures, the prophets called upon the people to draw closer to God, and Christ calls us to follow him. So that New Year's resolution may not just be a, you know, superstitious, you know, New Year's resolution, but something of significance. And it may take different forms. You may start a certain goal and find that as a year goes on and as life gets more busy, that it's just not sustainable. And so you modify that. But... The desire, the desire within us to continue doing something or doing something different in order to draw us closer to God, that should continue. And I believe that that is the Holy Spirit calling us to draw close, and we should listen to that. It's not just a superstition, it's a superficial thing. It's the calling of God upon our life each and every day to draw closer to God. So what are we going to do about it? A lesson from the Magi. I'm going to be going through this story a little bit um, from Matthew chapter 2. You're welcome to follow in your bulletin or your Bibles. First, we follow. Few of us started new reading plans or books, set aside more time this week to pray than we may maybe usually do, volunteered time to feed the hungry, made it a point to be here on a Sunday despite the snow, and made it a point to watch online despite what you could do, which is not. So many of us, regardless of what form it is taking, are making steps this year already to fulfill that desire and those goals within us. And that's good news. That's great news even. We did not ignore that call. We began to follow it. Others had great intentions this week, but something came up, and that's okay too. Try to find a way for you to follow that calling now. The Magi did not ignore the calling that God had for them because they took that first step and followed that star that rose that they believed to indicate a new king. And they followed it into Jerusalem, after all. If a new king of the people, of, Jer- of the Jewish people, was going to rise up, that king would likely be in Jerusalem, the place where any king would be. But when they got there, they met the current king, King Herod, the king of the Jews, and they knew that he was not the one that they were looking for. But they told him about their quest. And Herod tried to withhold his disturbance. After all, Herod was not a kind man. Herod was not a nice man. uh, Herod was an accomplished man. 
somebody who did great things, somebody who uh, had great accomplishments when it came to architect, architectural um, steps. But Herod killed his own sons because they were a threat to the throne. Herod killed his own wife. Herod was not somebody that was warm and fuzzy, was not somebody that maybe a star would rise for unless it was a burning fire star. So they knew that he was not this person. And Herod was asking, who is this person? So Herod summoned the priests and the people who studied and looked at the scriptures. And he asked them, where in the world is this, is this new king going to be born? And they said, well, he'd be born in Bethlehem. So he left the religious leaders behind. He went to the Magi, met with them in secret. And he asked them more questions like, I'm curious, when did you first see this star? Because he was trying to figure out how old that child might have been. He then told them to go to Bethlehem and search for him. And when they found him, Herod wanted them to come back and, you know, let him know where this child is so that he could honor this child, so that he could bow before this child. Sounds fishy, especially if Herod is a king and he could have had somebody follow these wise men pretty skillfully, but it seems like he wanted to keep everything a secret. It seemed like he wanted to lock that down. And I'm going to pause and let this part preach a little bit. Sometimes when we're trying to follow God, others are only interested when it benefits them. Sometimes, when we're trying to follow God, others act interested, but secretly they mock you or the journey that you're on. The question posed by this part of the text to me is, will we keep going? And the wise men kept going. The star appeared. We don't know if the star you know, disappeared for a time and then came back. Or we don't know, but they followed this star. We don't even know if it was a star at all. Maybe it was an angel was something else. But they followed the star and they came to the place where it stopped, a normal looking home with a mother, a father, and a little boy. Second, we bow. When the Magi entered the home, a home much poorer than they ever experienced, you know, that, that they were used to, maybe not ever experienced, but they weren't used to it, they bowed before not the father, not the mother, but the little boy. They knelt down to honor this king of the Jews, this Messiah who had a star that they had been following. And they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All three were valuable, but they weren't gifts that you give a child. They were gifts that you gave a king. Sometimes when we're called and we begin to follow, we don't know why yet. And it would have been easy for the Magi to see that it was only a child and turn around and grumble that they must have miscalculated all the way home. But the, mag- but the Magi found the why to their quest, and instead of turning back, they bow and they give the little boy kingly gifts. Many times when we're following God, we're faced with the reality of that calling that makes us want to turn around. You got a calling to help other people? That's great. That requires sacrifice. And it might be more sacrifice than you're willing to make. You got a calling to dig deeper in your faith. That's great. But that means waking up earlier, going to bed later, less TV time, scheduling time out of your day or week to invest in those goals. You got a calling to abstain from an addiction. That's great. But that means that you need to turn down the temptation to indulge. You need to turn down invitation from friends to hang out when it wouldn't be good for you. When we're faced with the reality of our humanity, we may have to adjust our speed in our journey, but we can't stop walking. Because remember something that was said. Remember when we're in this this journey and it's easy to throw in the towel, We tell ourselves, does God really want me to do this? Does God really mean that? Does God really want me to give this addiction up? And that's when we have to remember who else said that. Who else said, did God really 
mean that. It was a serpent in a garden. When we're faced with our imperfection, we're tempted to turn back from following the one true God as we try to manipulate God to fit our purpose instead of bowing the knee of our pride and surrendering to God's will. When the rubber meets the road, will we turn back or will we, burn, or, or will we bow down? Third, we change. The Magi were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. They could have gone back and even given him false information for some money, for some resources. But they chose to listen to that dream and to listen to the confirmation that Jesus was the king that they were looking for, not Herod. And they changed their route. And the lesson here, the lesson here is that when we have an encounter with God, it changes things. And if it doesn't, something is wrong. We may not have paid attention. We may not have been listening. We may not have gotten it. But if we have an, have an encounter with God and nothing changes, something is wrong. When we follow God when we are called, and we find out why as we surrender to God's way over our, our, over our own, lives change. Jesus speaks of the first time this happens as being born again. I've heard people tell stories over the years about how God turned their lives completely around and they really zone in on that identity of being born again. And for the people on a personal level, it's such a freeing and liberating moment that you can't help but wonder, you know, if this, is, if this happened, I, it totally changed their life. I've heard others who grew up, grew up in the church, kept going to the church, maybe spent some time away, but came back to the church, and they didn't have any of these wild and crazy years. And they kept coming to the church. And something to keep in mind here is, in these days, if you go to church past the age of 18, at some point in your life, God got a hold of you and showed you that there is more to your faith than what you learned as a child that your faith is relevant to you now. You are here for a reason. You are born again. Because when we get to a point where we bow down before God, when we kneel before our Messiah, our lives are going to change. And even when we've been following God for a while, and we've bowed down many times before, when we continually surrender, God continues to draw us to repentance and to change our lives to the way of God. And this good news is even larger than this story or our church because our Messiah came not just to be the king of the Jews, but to be the king of all people throughout time. Just like our God did not reach just the prophets and just the priests and the scribes, but even these wise men drawing them to the truth that was at Christ's feet. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 6, that the mystery, of Christ, the, the mystery of Christ is this, that the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise of God. How was this accomplished? Paul continues, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Just as God reached the Magi, so the gospel of Jesus Christ, of his life, ministry, death on the cross, and his resurrection, calls all people to follow the calling of God, to bow before Christ's cross, and to be liberated by the resurrection. God is calling you, and God is calling me, to lives that are dedicated to following the way of Christ, bowing our will and pride and surrender to his, and to allow all these moments to change our lives. And so, I ask again, what are we going to do about it? Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for all things. We thank you for this message of these wise men, these magi, these folks that we don't know why they're in, their story, uh, in this story other than to show us that your love and your mercy and your grace and your truth knows no bounds, that you will reach all, us all that you will reach us when we are in moments where we are closed off from the world, that you will reach us when we are in moments where we believe we are too far gone, 
that you will reach us in these moments of New Year's resolution and call, and call us to something that we are meant to follow after you and to draw closer to you all throughout our lives. Amen.